Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Tips and Tricks for Working from Home. Today's webinar is a production of the Virginia Small Business Development Center. With 27 centers across the Commonwealth, we provide training and technical assistance to small businesses. The Virginia SBDC is headquartered at George Mason University and is a program that is a cooperative agreement between the U.S. Small Business Administration premier institutions across Virginia and our local governments. My name is Stephanie Keener and I am the executive director for the Virginia SBDC that serves the city of Lynchburg, Amherst, Appomattox, Bedford, and Campbell counties. In our region, we're hosted at the Lynchburg Regional Business Alliance. Today's webinar is the second in our series with facilitator Jennifer Woofter on managing a remote business. To see other webinars coming up at the Virginia SBDC, go to virginiasbdc.org and click on COVID-19 resources or, at the, or to virginiasbdc.org or sbdclynchburgregion.org. Next week, we'll host training on hiring when you're working online and managing your supply chain remotely. We're developing more titles for the coming weeks. Today's facilitator, Jennifer Woofter, is the president and founder of Strategic Sustainability Consulting. She manages a remote workforce across the globe. She also serves as an SBDC advisor for the Virginia SP SBDC Lynchburg region. And today she's going to share with us the skills she's learned over the years for managing a remote workforce with 15 years of experience. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type those questions into the chat window. Tracy Nair at our George Mason headquarters will help us facilitate those questions at the end of the session. Jennifer will do her best to answer them. Jennifer? Hi, Stephanie, thanks so much. I'm so excited to be back here with you today, sharing my best tips and tricks from working from home. So as a, a small business owner, um, for the last 15 years, not only have I managed a remote workforce, many times during that 15 years, I have worked primarily from home. So I feel just sort of like, like the last session we did about managing a virtual uh, workforce, I feel like I have at one point or another made all of the mistakes that are commonly made uh, working from home and have learned my lesson the hard way. So I'm hoping I can share those lessons with you so that you can avoid them too. So I'm gonna share my screen. We're gonna give it just a second. It should probably be popping up in a second or two if it hasn't already. Fantastic, so let's get started. So the goal today is to give you um, some ideas for three real things. The first one is creating a routine for yourself. Uh, one of the most important success factors from working from home is getting yourself into a routine. The, the chaos, the uncertainty, doing something different every single day um, is takes a lot of time because our bodies have trouble getting settled. Um, and so the more that you can reduce the uncertainty for yourself and get yourself into a rhythm where you you uh, consciously and subconsciously understand what's coming next will help you be more productive and have a smoother work day. The second part is finding balance. Um, how do you balance uh, the fact that the, you have a PowerPoint due later this afternoon, but the dishes are also still dirty in the sink and you can see them out of the corner of your eye? Uh, there are a lot of details here that we'll go over about sort of planning uh, and structuring not just your workspace, um, but also your schedule to find the right level of balance for you. And the third element we'll talk about is just getting things done. What's the best way to use tools? Um, what's the best way to stay in touch with your team? What's the best way to um, organize your daily schedule? So the goal of today um, is to make sure that after this working from home experience that so many of us find ourselves suddenly in, uh, because of the coronavirus. We want this to be a successful experiment <laughs> so that once things get back to normal, telework is still an option because the reality is a lot of businesses that were reluctant 
to allow workers to work from home have been forced into that or suddenly have a large percentage of their workforce working from home. And what happens during the next few weeks is really going to determine whether or not our bosses change their minds about the value of work from home. If we can show that we're getting it done, that we're uh, hitting the milestones, that we're able to stay in touch with our team, if this is a good experience for you and your boss, you might want to be able to stay teleworking, if not all the time, maybe a couple days a week, all the way into the future. And, and really locking that down now is gonna make it uh, tremendously more likely that you will be able to retain some of that flexibility once things get back to normal. Okay, so the first step is getting on the same page as your boss. So in the last session we talked about managing a virtual workforce, I talked from the boss's side. And one of the first things I said was, you need to get in touch with your team and, and talk to them about what you're expecting. If, if your boss hasn't already done that for you, now the impetus is, is on you. Uh, you need to reach out to your boss. Schedule a 20 or a 30 minute video call uh, with them. Talk about uh, three things should be on your agenda. What your boss's goals are for the coming week or month or, or through the, the coronavirus pandemic. What are the key goals that your boss has that they're, they're really focused on delivering? The second element is what are your boss's concerns about the team working from home? Are they really concerned that um, people don't have the tools? Uh, or that people don't know how to use the tools? Are they, uh, is your boss really concerned that um, everyone's just gonna slack off because now they're, they're at home and, and, and she doesn't have eyes on them all the time? Uh, really try to get a sense of, of what your boss is thinking about, concerned about, worried about, nervous about. The more that you can understand that, the more that you can incorporate into your own routine things that are going to demonstrate to your boss that you are knocking it out of the park. Um, and then the third element is what kind of transparency does your boss want into your work from home life? Um, this is especially important for bosses who tend to want to micromanage. Um, I'm sure none of you guys have bosses that want to micromanage. Uh, but in the event that you do, understanding what type of information your boss wants um, and being able to preemptively give that to them may help your boss back off and give you a little bit more flexibility. Because really at the end of the day, the most important thing in, in a work from home mindset is the outcome. What is it that you need at the end of the day, the end of the week, the end of the month? Is it, um, you know, I need, 50, I need to be able to complete taxes for 15 of our clients. Um, if that's the outcome, then we can work backwards and figure out how to get that done, uh, as opposed to focusing on the process. And having a boss micromanage the process is going to be a headache for both of you. So the more that you can figure out what kind of information your boss wants um, from you on an ongoing basis, because they can't just pop by your office or your cubicle, uh, that will be helpful. So just having that initial conversation with your boss can go a long way to getting you both on the same page. Okay, so let's put that aside for just a second and talk about some of the practical aspects of working from home. Uh, the first element is creating your workspace. Now, in an ideal world, if you were going to be a, a permanent work from home person, you would want your own separate office. You would make sure that there was an extra bedroom in your house that you could uh, turn into your personal office, the door that you could close, um, space that is only dedicated for work. Now, the reality for most people who are suddenly thrust into a work from home situation is that very likely you are scrambling uh, to find a place uh, right now that, that you have not previously had a dedicated workspace. But now is the time to create that. So that could be your guest bedroom that you now turn into an office. Um, if you don't have a dedicated office or a, an extra bedroom you can use, look for something else, get creative. Um, I have a friend who has converted her master bedroom closet. It's like a walk-in closet. 
Um, it's very, very small, but it is walk-in. Uh, she has relocated all of those clothes to other closets in the house, and she has converted that closet into her work from home space. It has a door she can shut, it has a separate light, it has an outlet and a plug, um, she's all set. If you don't have a closet or some sort of space that you can close the door on, look for something else that can become a dedicated space. Maybe it's your dining room table. Now you're not gonna eat family dinners at the dining room table anymore. You're gonna move everybody to the kitchen because the dining room table is now mom's workspace. Um, in Worst case scenario, you're living in a studio apartment with no separate dining room. Maybe your couch has now, or one corner of your couch, or one side of your couch has now become the workspace. Um, but what that means is you are now not using that couch to sit and watch TV. As much as possible, creating a division in your mind and in your routine and in your physical space for this is work this is home is going to be powerful. So, so think right now, just take 30 seconds and think, what is your dedicated work at home space? What could it be if you have been sort of relocating from room to room or moving uh, from couch to kitchen table, but trying to clear it off every night for dinner? Think now, what space could you use? Could it be the garage? Could it be the attic? Could it be a bathroom somewhere that is less used, um, that has enough space to sort of put a, a folding table up? Uh, think about what is a dedicated space that can be separated from the rest of your, of your home life. The second element is that you need to pick a place that has high quality and reliable internet. I have a beautiful little nook in my house that I would be just an ideal place to work, but it's in that one spot where I cannot get good internet. Uh, I can get email on things, but it's not good enough quality for a video call. And in my work, I do a lot of video calling. So think about where you have good access to internet if you might need to get uh, an internet um, booster or a, a secondary pod um, you know that, that sort of amplifies your internet for a specific area uh, think about that if, if you see working from home now happening for weeks or months ahead that is going to be a good investment and ask your boss if they will cover the cost of that in, in a lot of cases businesses are uh, trying to be creative trying to get productivity up and maybe willing to cover the cost of, of uh, something that will improve the internet at your house uh, you also want to make sure you have access to electricity. So working in a closet is great unless there is no plug. Um, you, your laptop will eventually run out of batteries. You do not want to find yourself having to move to the couch midway through the day because that's where the access to the electricity is. Uh, you also want to make sure that you have flat space. So whether that's for papers, whether that's for your cup of tea, you do not want to be balancing things on your lap. Um, so even if in worst case scenario, you find yourself working from a couch, pull a folding table up or a TV tray up to the couch. Don't work on your lap. And the last thing is you want a clear line of sight. This is about tricking our brain into turning off all those distractions about the undone laundry, the dishes in the sink. You want as much as possible in your line of sight from your work to have no mess, no distractions. Um, so if you're in a place where you can actually physically close the door, that is ideal. Um, if you're not in a place where you can close the door or where you're getting up or where you're in an area with a lot of foot traffic, Think about moving the laundry out of the living room into one of the bedrooms. Don't worry about folding it yet, just get it out of sight. That there is, there is something about being able to see a clean and tidy space that allows you to have sort of a clean and tidy brain that can sit and focus. So think about where your paths are. Um, if your workspace, you know, from you to the kitchen, you to the bathroom, those are gonna be your two main uh, places where you're getting up and moving as much as possible, cleaning those spaces out and prioritizing keeping those clean will make a big difference in the amount of distraction that you feel managing, you know, the stuff that's not getting done at home. Okay, so the next part, we've created your workspace. Now let's create your work at home persona. Because again, this is about tricking your brain uh, and creating a visual clue to yourself that you are now working. 
uh, you, you're working and then you are living at home. And when you are working at home, there needs to be some kind of physical difference on your body that says to yourself, I am now working. So for me, that is bright lipstick. I always put on bright lipstick. That is my signal to myself that I am going for the day. Um, once I do that, I'm on. Um, it might be getting all the way dressed. I have a few colleagues who wear professional business attire at work. I mean, like, shoot, I, I, I don't wear shoes at home, but they're like in high heels at home. Like as part from top to bottom, they feel like when they are dressed professionally, it is a signal to themselves and their body that they are on for work. Now, my feeling is that's pretty extreme. Um, I think what you often will find is some sort of mix, sort of professional on the top, comfy on the bottom. So that might be joggers or sweats or leggings on the bottom and uh, maybe a nicer cardigan on the top. Something that looks like you're sort of, you've tried and you've put together. Another benefit of this is when you are on your video calls, you will look uh, like you tried a little bit. Uh, you may have a job or you may have a lifestyle where you just know that is not important to you. That is not important to your productivity. You know yourself well enough that, that sort of physically getting dressed in the morning is, is not that big of a deal. Uh, it's not really that much of a cue for your brain. At a minimum, change your clothes. Do not work in the clothes you slept in. Even if that means changing into your day pajamas, make sure that there is a physically different look you have during your work from home time. And what I would say is, again, routine is really important. So don't say Mondays I'm going to be full on professional dressed and then Tuesdays I'm going to be day pajamas and then I'm going to go back to fully professional. Pick one look, pick one style and stick to it as much as possible. Um, this idea, again, that our body craves routine and, and, and there is also this visual cue, right? Even subconsciously about what being on looks like. So pick one, whatever you think is most appropriate for your, your own level of productivity um, and what you're expected to have from your boss. You know, when you have your, your video call, what is your boss expecting to see on the other side um, of, of the video camera? So pick one thing and go with it. Okay, so we've chosen our workspace. We've looked at our, our work from home persona. Now let's talk about creating a routine. Um, the first and most important piece is understanding your personal rhythm. Um, so really knowing yourself. And if this is not an exercise you have already undertaken for yourself, I really recommend that you take the next few days and be extra diligent in checking in with yourself um, about how you're feeling. And this is a little woo-woo, but it's really important and it actually is is backed up by science in all sorts of ways that each person has their own circadian rhythm of when they're feeling most energetic when they feel antsy when they lose momentum so for me i know my personal rhythm is i am most productive i am a powerhouse on mondays like i can easily work 12 to 16 hours and be totally in the moment getting stuff done and then sort of as the week goes on it it tanks and by thursday friday i'm pretty useless so that's my weekly rhythm but even my daily rhythm i am a night owl i much prefer to work in the evenings i'm terrible in the mornings but i also know that if i don't get up in the mornings it will easily be noon before i'm you know, my natural body is. So I have to artificially create a schedule in the morning in order to get myself going. So really think about and, you know, keep a note on your phone or keep a, a journal if you do that. Really be thinking about when are you most productive? When do you have a lot of energy? When are you distracted? Um, if you know that you always have a uh, a 3 to 5 p.m. slump where you just want to go take a nap. If you're at work, that's not so much of an issue because there's no nap room. 
But if you're at home and the couch is right there, it's going to be a lot harder to, to deal with. So either schedule yourself so that you can take a nap from three to five every afternoon or figure out a way to, to be addressing that. Understanding it and recognizing that in yourself um, is going to be especially important because you're going to be lacking the structure of a physical workplace to do that for you. The second element is understanding your obligations. So when are you gonna to need to be available for team meetings? If you have a daily team video call check-in in the morning, um, don't, don't plan to be doing other stuff during that time. Um, if you know that there is, um, if there are work requirements or life requirements uh, that you have to do. So if you, for example, um, have to take medication twice a day and it needs to be 12 hours apart and that's really important for medical compliance uh, make sure you're scheduling your day to allow for that don't don't decide that you're going to be doing uh work uh during that two-hour window when you need to be eating dinner and, and taking your medicine uh, and the third element is shared responsibilities. If you have kids at home, if you are uh, living with, uh, with a partner or a spouse, understand what are the joint things that need to be done. Uh, this, from a practical perspective, is one of the toughest in shifting to a work from home mentality, especially if both of you have suddenly become work from home people. You may be competing over the same resources. Maybe only one of you can change your master closet into an office. Um, and there may also be suddenly additional requirements or responsibilities like, man, who's managing these kids that usually are at school and now are at home? So understanding, not even planning yet, just understanding, making a master list of all of these things your rhythm, your obligations, and your shared responsibilities is gonna be really important before you start creating a routine. So my number one tip for actually getting into a routine is block scheduling. Actually write in your calendar, if you use Google calendars or if you have an Outlook, whatever tool you use for managing your calendar, it has now become a thousand times more important that things, anything you do should be showing up in your calendar. Because again, without the physical structure and the routines imposed by an office setting, things are gonna feel a lot more fluid and flexible. And to some extent, that's good. We need that in uncertain and chaotic times. But we also need to make sure that we are creating, even artificially creating, that structure for ourselves as much as possible. So here's an example of some block scheduling. So maybe at 8.15, I'm doing breakfast and getting ready and making sure the kids are set. At 9 o'clock, I'm going to do an email check. At 9.45, I've got to get on the video call for my, my team check-in. Uh, between 10 and noon, I'm going to just do focused project work. I'm gonna give myself an hour and a half for lunch and maybe, you know, so I can clean up the dishes afterwards and maybe you have time for a quick walk. Um, at, from 1.30 to three, I'm gonna spend time with my kids, right? Normally that would be a work thing, but I'm actually gonna shift that later in my day because my kids need some time and some engagement and I just can't leave them on their own for, for the entire day. So early afternoon is gonna be my kid block. At three o'clock, I'm gonna have a social check-in. I am going to, create the social drop-in that I would normally get from a work experience. So I'm gonna set up video calls with friends. I am going to make sure I call my mom and check in. I am going to do a, uh, I'm going to force myself into some kind of social engagement that doesn't have to do with work, uh, but it, that is providing the social interaction that a physical work setting provides. At the end of the day, at 4 o'clock, I'm going to check my email again. 4.30, I'm going to spend the last half hour of my normal work day wrapping up and doing a planning for the next day. That We're going to come back to that and, and talk about that more at the end. From 5 to 8, I'm going to spend time with dinner and getting my kids uh, done with their evening routine. Starting at 8, I'm going to go back to my project work, and I'm going to give myself 90 minutes at the end of the day after my kids are in bed to wrap up my project work. Now, what you'll see as you look at this block scheduling is that the actual amount of dedicated work I'm doing 
is less than eight hours. Realistically, the work that you are doing in a workspace is less than eight hours. There have been some studies that show that people at work in a cubicle in an office really are getting about four to five hours of work uh, done even over an eight or nine hour work period because they're checking email, they're doing some online shopping, they're talking on the phone, they've stopped and had a chat in the hallway about the TV show that was on uh, last night. Um, and they're just, they're not being productive. And so don't feel like you need to block schedule in eight dedicated hours of work. In fact, and we'll look at some of the evidence later on, there's actual, um, in some of the studies that have been done, uh, people who work from home are actually getting five days worth of work done in, on an average of four days. So go ahead and give yourself some grace. Obviously, this requires that you be dedicated and getting stuff done during that dedicated project time, but don't feel like you need to block schedule in eight full hours of work just to fill in eight hours. Um, the most important things here, obviously you can modify your schedule to whatever works best for you and what your requirements are. Maybe you don't have kids at home and you don't need that dedicated time, but maybe you have a dog that now suddenly needs to be walked three or four times a day because you, you know the, the dog walker uh, isn't coming anymore. So obviously tailor it to your needs. The most important thing is to schedule dedicated email checks. Do not be checking email all the way through the day. Um, that is a huge time suck, um, and it is, it is something that will dramatically lower your productivity. So at a minimum, I say a half hour uh, in the morning and in, in, at the end of your nor normal workday, um, around 5 p.m. Uh, I always include a daily social break, whether that's uh, taking a walk and chatting with my neighbors, whether that's doing a video call um, or sometimes just hanging out on social media and, and messaging friends. Um, and the third thing is that end of day wrap up and planning. It is so, so important for you to create accountability for yourself. Um, and we'll talk about that more later, but having a dedicated time at the end of your work day to step back and say, here's what I accomplished, here's any problems I ran into, um, and here's how I'm, what my day looks like for, for tomorrow is incredibly important in creating that sense of momentum and artificial structure for yourself. Okay, so let's talk about like getting stuff done. Um, uh, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but one of the most important things in a work from home mindset is going from thinking about the process to thinking about the outcome. So if your job is, um, so for my job, I write a lot of reports, like the report is the outcome of the, of the consulting project. Um, and so I focus more on how do I get the report done, like what, what needs to happen to get the report done, and less on the process of it. Um, it doesn't matter if I write the report in my pajamas, my, my day pajamas, <laughs> or in a business suit. It doesn't matter if I write the report at 8 a.m. or 8 p.m. The process, the, the elements, the, the physicality of it doesn't matter nearly as much as just getting it done. And so being really clear with your boss and with yourself about what the outcome of your job tasks are is the number one most important takeaway. Um, and if you can't very clearly define that for yourself right now in this moment, I would strongly suggest that you take some time today, get a, a piece of paper or pull up a blank sheet of on your computer and really outline for yourself on a daily, weekly basis during the coronavirus, what are the outcomes that you need to be hitting? If you are unable to clarify that, you need to get on the call with your uh, up with your boss immediately and really talk it through. Uh, you need crystal clarity uh, on this item. Once you understand what the outcomes are, now you can work backwards and figure out what are the incremental tasks and milestones to get to that outcome. Um, are there, you know, for my reports, are there specific drafts that have to be done? Is there specific data that needs to be collected? Is there a review or editing process? Some of my reports require a secondary person to work on graphic design. So really understanding how those pieces all fit together is going to be really important. And the third element alongside that is identifying your group touch points. So if you have other people who are either feeding you information in that you are 
using for your own work or you are feeding information to other people for their work getting clarity among all of those those pathways is really important again what is the outcome that they need or that you need and does everyone understand that does everyone understand the incremental milestones along the way and do we understand how things work together among a team who now maybe for the first time is no longer physically proximate to each other i can't just stand up and look across the cubicle and talk to my team members so let's talk about working from home what are what makes people more productive what makes people less productive there have been a couple studies there's one from 2014 that actually found that people working full-time from home get five days worth of work done done in four days but it's not all kinds of work in fact dull tasks so boring things things that you consider boring you are going to have a harder time doing in a work from home situation uh, and the reason because you're in a less structured environment there's more distractions you're like oh man like reviewing this doc like i find document editing to be really boring like copy editing reading through for clarity grammar formatting i find that to be extremely boring um but and so i know that for me i need to do that in a place and in a time in my personal circadian rhythm uh where i am more easily able to focus so i'm not going to do that at times when I know my kids are running around. Uh, I might save that for late in the day after they've gone to bed because I find my kids to be very distracting. Um, so really thinking about um, your boring jobs, the ones or the elements or the tasks that you find the most uh, dumb, um, putting those tasks in a time in your schedule when you have higher levels of focus is going to be and if fewer distractions is going to be really important the other part of the study found that creative tasks you're actually better at doing them at home maybe because of that flexibility again that you're able to you know if you're brainstorming um or being creative some of my best ideas come to me like while i'm taking a shower i don't know what it is the water uh what it is but i sometimes will say okay here's the problem i need to really think about uh, now i'm gonna think about it while i go walk the dog or while i take a shower or um things like that or i'm gonna maybe i need to sketch out some ideas for how the graphic design components of this report could go and i'm gonna do that um maybe maybe i do better like standing up at my kitchen table doing that rather than sitting at my desk the ability to to get up and move your body or change your situation during more creative tasks is something that works together very nicely so again as you think about your schedule and you think about your routine dividing up those tasks and identifying which ones are boring and more structured and need to be accommodated that way versus what tasks are more creative which ones are more exciting to you which ones are more interesting uh, and modifying your schedule and and the um the items that are adjacent to that or or happen in parallel with it um like doing the dishes or walking the dog or, or things like that um can be really helpful um okay so just a couple thoughts about um like the actual tangible practical things about getting things done the pomodoro technique is something that is really brilliant um there's books about it there's tons of information on on just freely on the internet if you're interested i just grabbed this image off the off the web um it is this idea that we do better under pressure even if we know that that pressure is artificially created for us and so the model works with a timer so you can use a physical timer this is actually the, the name of it comes from the tomato timer that the pomodoro inventor uh, used to track his own time you can set a timer on your your computer or your phone the idea is you set your timer for 25 minutes 25 minutes is long enough to get something significant done and short enough that it doesn't feel interminable pick your task it's maybe it's checking your email for example check your email for 30 minutes you would be shocked at how much you can get done in 25 minutes so set it for 25 minutes do the task no distractions you are not pulling up documents during that time you are not talking to your children during that time you're not taking phone calls you're not doing anything you are just checking your email when the when the timer goes off you are done 
you're not going back and checking email after this this um, you know the timer dings until your next so you know your next check-in point and then you get a five minute break this is you get up you move your body you check social media you water your plants um, you do whatever it is you get five minutes just to reset your brain then you go back and you set your, your timer for 25 minutes again and you repeat the process and then after four breaks or four sprints so that's a two hour period you get a longer break so every two hours you get 15 or 30 minutes to reset and refresh so that might be going for a longer walk it might be uh switching out the laundry and, and actually folding the laundry and putting it away it might be vacuuming the whole house it might just be looking at amazon for a half hour the idea is that you're giving your brain a break for that time period so this schedule you can actually go through it potentially four times during the day um, for for an eight hour work block but again we know we don't we're working from home we're focused on the outcome the process the butt in seat doing the work uh, doesn't have to be as structured as it is from home but creating this kind of shorter term structure can be really impactful so if you're using the Pomodoro technique at home, and I highly recommend that you try it even just for one day, uh, do it for tomorrow and see how it goes for you. The concept here is that each hour you get two five minute breaks. And the way I like to break it up at home is one of those five minute breaks is for me. It's a social media, I get up and stretch. Um, I, you know, you can, if you're athletic, you can do some squats by your desk, something to kind of get your body going, get your heart rate up. Maybe it's your bathroom break. Um, it's something purely just for you. And at home, one of those five minute breaks is something for your home. So it is uh, emptying the dishwasher. It is vacuuming a room. It is switching the laundry. Um, five minutes doesn't feel like very much, but set your timer. You would be astounded at how much you can do in five minutes, especially when you are racing the clock. Um, and this is something that we'll come back to sort of at the end, but is really good if you find yourself procrastinating or having a hard time getting started. Setting that timer, there is something evolutionary about our brains that once that timer is going, it really helps lock it down. So even if you end up going back to a um, not a work from home situation, maybe you're back in your office or whatever, try setting setting that uh, timer. Um, and actually, the Pomodoro method is really is intended like for a work day. Um, but you can use it in all sorts of situations and you can change the timing. So sometimes I like to mix it up and we'll say, okay, so I have 17 minutes to edit this document. Okay, go. There, there is something about setting a timer for random amounts of time that really helps um, get you concentrated and, and on task. Okay, so let's talk about keeping in touch with your team. Um, so you, unless you, are very unusual at some level you have a team that you're working with whether it's just you and your boss that you report to um, or other people who are also working on similar projects that you need to interact with opt for frequent check-ins one of the things we talked about um, in our previous session about managing a virtual team I said bosses you need to be doing a daily video check-in with your team Keep it short, 20 minutes in the morning. Everybody gets together, gets on video, and we talk about what the priorities are for the day, what obstacles have, have come up that need to be addressed, and any, um, any changes that people need to be aware of. Easy, quick, but everybody's there together. If your boss hasn't done that yet, if that's not in place, maybe suggest that that, that be a, a component of, of the work from home uh, rhythm. Um, but you, at a minimum, need to be doing frequent check-ins. I highly recommend that you get comfortable with video chats. 90% uh, of, of interactions are nonverbal. There is something tremendously more valuable um, and more satisfying about being able to see the person that you're talking to. So get comfortable with Google Hangouts or FaceTime Messenger or Skype or whatever it is that your team likes to use. Um, Video is going to be best. Conversations, um, phone calls, uh, synchronous where we're both talking at the same time is going to be best for planning and decision making. 
don't plan and decision make via email. It, it takes too long. There, there's too much room for miscommunication. But do also do a daily email summary to your boss and your team. So this is what I'm talking about in that block scheduling where I said a wrap up and planning session. I have a half hour dedicated at the end of the day to wrapping up everything, making sure I know where my stopping place is, making sure I know what my goals are for the next day, and also sharing that information back with whoever needs to know. So it might be for you a daily email summary to your boss that says, hey boss, um, here, you know, here are the things I, you know, here are the things I accomplished today. Um, here's the things uh, that went wrong or that, that I didn't accomplish or, or obstacles that I've encountered. Um, and here's what the plan, you know, here's help that I need from you or information I'm, I'm running, you know, I need from the team. And then here's what my priorities are for tomorrow. Um, I really like to use a template version so that the boss or, or the team that you're sending this to starts to recognize and get into that rhythm of understanding what I'm getting, you know, knowing what to look for. It should take maybe five or 10 minutes to write. Bullet points are fantastic. Um, but again, what I accomplished, problems or obstacles, and what my plan is for the next day. Those three things, just a quick email off to your boss can, especially if they're a micromanager, give them that sense that like you're on top of it, you are proactive, you are keeping the flow of communication going. And it, it creates a paper trail if other people on the team are not holding up their end of the bargain. And I, that's something that I, I think sometimes is hard to talk about because we want to assume everyone's doing their best and everyone's doing something great. But the reality is, as people get used to this new system, some things are going to fall through the cracks. And what you want is a clear record of, hey, I know, you know, remember like every day this week, I noted that the data wasn't ready yet, right? Like, don't, don't blame me that my report is not done. Like I got the parts I could get done. I have noted that the data was not ready every day this week. So, uh, and I asked for help on that and, and really making sure that those obstacles get surfaced early and in writing um, is going to create a, a better sense of transparency and accountability for others on your team, as well as for yourself. Make sure you have access uh, and understand where information is going to be accessible. So if your business already has a, or organization already has a SharePoint site, um, make sure you understand how to use that. Make sure you know which password is. Um, if you use Dropbox or Google Drive for Google Docs or something like that, wherever the information is, make sure you know where it is and how to access it. And also make sure you know any security requirements. So if you're Again, your boss should do this, but if they haven't, you may need to double check about you know, data security requirements. So for example, um, hey boss, just wanna flag this. Um, I need access to customer information that has personally identifiable information, like addresses, credit card numbers, um, passwords, uh, things like that. Um, but I don't really think, you know, is it okay for me to be able to access that on my personal device working from home? Like, if that's not something that has been proactively communicated to you, think about raising that issue yourself. You don't need to decide, that's, that's probably not your role, but making sure that you have asked those thoughtful questions is gonna be um, really helpful and also go, again, a step in showing that your boss that you are proactively and responsibly thinking about how to get the job done in the best way possible. Um, I also really love social check-ins. So while my daily social check-in that I schedule for three to four um, is usually with friends or family, I also periodically, at least once or twice a week, like to do a virtual check-in with my colleagues. So sometimes that's um, a lunch date where we both sit in front of our computers and we do a Google Hangout and we eat our lunches while we talk about just purely social things, how their kids are doing, uh, funny things my cat is doing, um, how we're holding up in this weird time in the world. Um, you may also choose to um, do a virtual happy hour, um, something that could be a glass of wine after kids have gone to bed. Um, it could be, you know, four to five. It can be even while you are cooking dinner. Sometimes, you know, prop your computer up and, and um, FaceTime message one of your colleagues and you guys can 
make dinner together um, while, while you chat. Make sure that you are dedicating that time to keep the social bonds up with work because just, just from a, a mental health perspective, the social bonds are a huge part of where, what's getting us through times of chaos and upheaval. And of course now we're particularly in one of those situations, but even if we were not talking about a coronavirus pandemic, Working from home, that, that is a transition. Making that transition is hard and can be isolating and intentionally and proactively setting up those virtual check-ins can go a long way to, to smoothing the path forward. Um, okay, so staying on track. Um, use your tools. If now is the time, if you have put off learning how to use Zoom, uh, figuring out how to access your SharePoint drive, um, if you, if your organization has a CRM, a customer relationship manager, is that what CRM stands for? Customer relationship model manager, a, a tool to kind of uh, assign tasks to each other and, and use your schedule. Um, now, now is a great time to invest a little bit of time and effort into getting comfortable and familiar with those. The best teacher is practice. Schedule those meetings, use the tool, force yourself into getting comfortable with it until it becomes a habit. The third thing is pick three things. Every day you should only have three big priorities. Anything more than that and you're not going to get it done. Um, what are the three things every day, you know, at the end of the day, as you're thinking about the next day, as you're writing that email to your boss about what I'm planning to do tomorrow, it should be three things. Anything more than that and, and you are now dividing your attention into too many places. And the third element is know when to walk away. Know when to force yourself to take a break. There are gonna be times, despite your best block scheduling, despite knowing your rhythm and your personal routines about when you're productive and when you're not, there are going to be times when you are going to hit a mental or physical roadblock and you just can't keep going. Know when that is and have a plan. Getting up and walking away. Taking a quick walk around the block staying six feet away from your nearest neighbor. Um, whether it's getting up and um, taking a five minute break to go vacuum or something, especially allowing yourself to do something physical allows your brain more easily to reset. So know when to walk away is not click over to a new window in your computer and look at Amazon. Like that is not enough of actually walking away. Like get up and your computer um, when you have those moments. Um, do you want to do ideas about working from home with kids? Um, so I just, I did like a little Google image search. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, it is really easy to fall into any of these photos. <laughs> what I want to say here is that Two of these photos are better than the others. You want to, again, have that, that dedicated space separately from, um, from where your kids are. On the bottom row, um, we have uh, poor mom on the right with her kids bouncing on their bed. Um, again, she has gone into their space um, and they are chaos and she is trying to be a bubble um, of, of work and isolation. Whereas you see on the left hand side, um, this is a mutual space. So they're both working from a couch. Um, she has a flat space for her tea. She's not trying to do it on the floor or on her lap. Um, and her son is is doing his space next as to much her as but possible doing his own you. thing. So as much as possible, either allowing your children to come into your space in a separate area um, or going into a mutual space, try not to work from home. I say kids do great with timers. Uh, like productivity aside, if you struggle getting your kids to do something or being on time or, or you got, I have one kid who is just like a champion procrastinator. If I bring that timer out, um, suddenly there is this drop there is this external it's a it's an internal competition with themselves try the timer with them too um here is an example of of my block scheduling so there's my schedule on the left this is the one that we saw earlier in the presentation now that my husband is also working from home and my working together in a joint schedule 
So we all together have breakfast together from 8.15 to 9. In the morning from 9 to 10, while I'm checking my email and doing that, that team check-in, my husband is with the kids. His responsibility is to do something with them. Um, and then from 10 to noon, we're both working on projects while, while our kids get screen time. We, I think we're giving ourselves grace. Our kids get two hours of watching TV from 10 to noon. Uh, we all eat lunch together um, at, from, and have a break from noon to 1.30. And then I take the kids while Bill does project work. Um, and then at three o'clock, while I'm doing my social check-in, so are my kids. So they get to use my phone for an hour to call grandma, granddad, aunts, cousins, friends from school on video calls while I am using my laptop to do a, vis uh, a video check-in. And that's something with earphones that we can actually do. If I'm wearing earphones and they're wearing earphones, we can actually physically do in the same room without bothering each other. Um, and so this idea of like changing back and forth, either the kids are in a dedicated something that I know they can do successfully on their own, like watch TV, um, or they are doing something separate from me, but we can do jointly, like video calls. We can both do video calls in the same room. Or in times when we know they're going to need some level of supervision or engagement with a parent, I'm making sure that between my spouse and I that we are, we are trading that off. So I know and they know um, when they need to go to mom versus when they need to go to dad for uh, something that they need help with. Um, so that I think is it can be really helpful if you don't already have like a shared Google calendar with your spouse um, Start one now and and sort of the rule at our house is if your thing isn't on the shared calendar it doesn't a Mandatory team meeting isn't on there I'm, I'm sorry like that your failure to plan is not an emergency for me um, and of course there is some grace there, but but really both of us have very high pressure jobs. We've got a lot of things going, and that's part of the commitment we have to each other is to be proactively identifying when we need me time for work versus when we can sort of be more flexible in, in being the primary um, touch point for our kids. Okay, with that, we have a few minutes left over. Turn it over to you. Have we had questions? come in and there's probably still some time to, to enter your questions if you want. I do have one question at this point, Jennifer, great presentation. Just a point of clarification, was the comment to pick only three things to accomplish for the day, meaning more than three tasks is too much? Three work things, I mean, you might have three, I, I really say what are the mandatory three things that must be done today? I might have a whole nother list of other stuff that if I get to, great. But, but really, if you have more than three things that must be done today, you probably are looking for too much. Now, I'm not counting things like dinner, like we have to eat dinner or the family will, will fall apart. Yes, of course, those things. I'm thinking about work. Like I have, this report has got to be done and turned over to the graphic designer. That's one thing. Two things is I need to review the data that has come in from my data person. That's my second thing. My third thing, I need to have um, I need to have the call with my boss. Like th those those are my three things. Um, anything more than that is probably too much because things change, different priorities come up. If you can identify just the most important two or three things in your day, you will have a lot more success in prioritizing them as opposed to if you have a list of 10 things that have to be done today and you're only gonna do seven of them, um, you will spend a lot of time, un unnecessary time, looking at that list and deciding which one should you be working on. Um, the, the less time that you spend making decisions about priorities during the day, the more time you can dedicate to actually doing, doing the work. I think we have one more question um, from Kim. Her internet bugged out when you were talking about the virtual happy hours. Can you review that for us? Um, yeah, so virtual happy hour is really just like, just what it sounds like. <laughs> uh, you can set up a, a Google Hangout. We'll do, um, I think, 
between four and 10 people um, on video. Um, you could do Skype, you can do, pick, pick your favorite video tool. Zoom uh, will do it as well. Um, like set up a time that everyone calls in and everyone brings their favorite beverage. <laughs> that could be wine, that could be orange juice. Uh, it could be a mixture of the two. Um, that it really is just a time, think about it like going to happy hour with somebody, you're just doing it separately together. Um, that could be from four to five, it could be after bedtime, right? It, it, if you're dealing with people in very different time zones, um, it might be a virtual coffee slash happy hour, you know, someone at 8 a.m. maybe is your virtual happy hour, that you're there at 8 a.m. drinking your morning coffee while your uh, team member halfway around the world is at 8 p.m. drinking their glass of wine. The idea is that you are dedicating time for social bonding that has nothing to do with work, unless maybe it's complaining about your boss. Like th things that you would do during a happy hour, you are doing together just via video rather than being physically together. Um, another question, I find it difficult not to live in email. Have you found it useful to add in your signature block that you only check email two or three times a day so people don't expect an instant acknowledgement or response to an email? Some people treat email as I am. Yeah, I mean, I, this is one where your experience may vary and I, I'm not gonna tell you that, that your way is, is not valuable. I think a lot of times it's very easy to think that people are paying more closely, more closer attention to you than they really are. <laughs> I, I find that like, if you just do it, often people won't even notice. And especially if in that daily email back out to your team, you say, okay, things I accomplished are, um, you know, here's what I accomplished, here's the obstacles I found, here's what I'm planning tomorrow. Even just a little thing like, by the way, something tr I'm trying this week is just only checking my email at 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. Um, that's just really, I, I'm, I've, I've heard that it really helps with productivity. I'll be trying it this week. If you feel like you need me more urgently, please give me a call on my phone at this number. Um, just, just like a one-time notice to your team, I think can be really helpful. Talking to your boss though, that early on really about those those expectations if they need you to be on email all the time maybe email you know chunking doesn't work for you maybe you need to add a three times a day email check-in nine noon and four um, to the extent possible restricting the amount of time that you are on email and it's so hard right it's so tempting to just keep that tab open as you're as you're working to flip back and forth to the extent that you can remove that as a distraction, your productivity is going to go way, way, way up. But yeah, talk to your boss about it. Make sure they're okay and understand and, and that they're uh, aware of or at least can't deny later <laughs> that you had that conversation. But, you know, restricting it to two or three times a day can be really, really helpful. Um, so, um, Last question, thinking about the future when we're able to return to the office, what do you think is a good amount of telework off for employees? I think this really largely depends on uh, your type of business um, and the size of your team and your, um, the, your personal job responsibilities. So I think what you will often find is that working from home um, one or two days a week is usually pretty easy to swing. Uh, you may decide, um, your, your work people may decide, or you as a team may decide that um, there are dedicated work from home days, like um, Wednesday's work from home day or something like that, so that everyone's kind of doing it. Uh, the one thing that you wanna be cautious about, especially now as you're establishing a routine, is that, um, Bosses have a real fear that working from home on Mondays or Fridays becomes an extra long weekend. Um, so as you're working from home all of the time now, make sure that you are really doing an extra good job of being diligent on Mondays and Fridays. And as you transition back, make sure that you are being responsible <laughs> in not using a Monday or Friday work at home as a three-day weekend. 
unless unless that's the arrangement you make with your boss. I mean, like if you can get your work done in four days, out of and and go with God, right? Like by all means, go do that. But be really clear and have you know sort of all cards on the table in that frank discussion with your boss about um, about the expectations, especially sort of on bookending the weekend. I think that's all the questions we have. Stephanie, do you want to go ahead and close it out? Sure. Thanks, Jennifer, so much. Um, that was great. And Tracy for keeping us up and online. I know um, our local internet providers are definitely experiencing a challenge in this, in this environment. So next week, we'll be hosting training on hiring when you're working online and managing your supply chain. You can register for those at sbdclinchburgregion.org or search for us on Facebook at either Virginia Small Business Development Center or um, SBDC Lynchburg Region. You can see the recorded training that we have to offer by searching Virginia SBDC on YouTube. So we'll see everybody next week and stay well. Bye. <laughs>